with Barbara Desmond, who cannot be here tonight. I want to first thank Linda Zagaria, the president of the National Arts Club, for coming and, um, and being such a great part of all the programs here at the club. I next want to thank um, Sharon Grossman and Lou Haygood, our two former chairs of our committee, who together have run the committee and be participated in it for a quarter century or so. So thank you very much. And to the committee members and Peter McElhaney. Every good event should lead you to other great events. Harriet Fields is going to appear with the film My Little Chickadee in August 25th at a May West festival that Kathy Beale here in the, in the room has helped, is helping to organize. I want to thank some others in the audience. I want to thank Chris Mason and Emma Hughes from the newly opened, reopened Quad Cinema, John Mirapiri and Jed Ratfogel of Anthology Film Archives, which is expanding with a, with a library and a roof deck and much else. Bob Tevis, popular culture historian, writes for Classic Images. Lorcan and Jeannie Otway, thanks for coming. Owners of Theater 80 St. Mark's, where they have a preservation effort going on. You might get involved, get, consider getting involved in. David Jardina, our filmographer. Stephen Friedman, our photographer. Mark Barron, the shepherd of the Lambs, the head of the Lambs Club, which is the oldest professional theatrical association in America. I want to thank Ed Gaines, the award-winning off-Broadway owner and producer, um, theater owner um, of St. Luke's Theater. I want to thank Jeffrey Hardy, attorney and actor. Sidney Myers, the phenomenal, phenomenal cabaret singer. And Bob Greenberg, a terrific comedian. Our three, and I want to thank my sister Susan and my brother Rob, Rob for coming. I'm now going to introduce our panelists and speakers. He's been called the thinking man's talk show host. For me, watching in Maine in the 1970s as a young, as a young kid, he was dazzling, cosmopolitan, soft-spoken, from Hoffa to Hitchcock. His show burst with sophistication and style. Salvador Dali tossing his pet anteater into Lillian Gish's lap. Groucho Marx asking Truman Capote if he'd marry him. Gloria Swanson sitting with Janis Joplin. Throw in Noel Coward, Orson Welles. To the bombast of writer Norman Mailer um, sitting next to him, Cavett demurred. Perhaps you'd like two more chairs to contain your intellect. <laughs> Jack Parr, early on, told Cavett, make it a conversation. And what a conversation this gentleman has led over the decades. Thank you, um, Dick Cavett. Our other panelist is Rob King. He's a film professor at Columbia University with a specialization in early film and comedy, American cinema, popular culture, and social history. He's written acclaimed books, Keystone Film Company, and most recently, Hokum, the early sound slapstick short and depression era mass culture. In his film classes, he's a popular teacher. He screens W.C. Um, Fields films, including You're Telling Me and Man on the Flying Trapeze. Um, a critic said of his book, Hokum, with solid research, jewel-like prose, and plenty of wry humor, he convincingly busts the myths and chases away the nostalgia for silent comedy. Instead, we, we're left with a lasting sense of the form's persistent cultural relevance. Thank you. And when I first suggested the NAC Film Committee that we have a program on W.C. Fields, 
I thought there was no greater ambassador to spread the word of W.C. Fields than Dr. Harriet Fields, who has worked tirelessly to keep the legacy of her grandfather alive for younger generations. She said to me, I'm not a professional granddaughter. I have, I have a day job. A member of Teachers College Alumni Council. She's a nurse, educator, and a global health expert um, in healthcare policy, human healthcare reform. Um, and she's working on the next performance of her off-Broadway show of an actual incident, the real transcript of W.C. Fields' murder trial of a canary, a true story in 1928. She's also gone to Rwanda, to rural villages. She screened there her grandfather's films at the Cueto Film Festival in Kigali, providing insights into how humorous W.C. Fields universally um, relates to the human condition. So with great pleasure, I introduce Dr. Harriet Fields. Thank you, thank all of you. Um, W.C. Fields, and I chose this photo, but you can't quite see it, but it's on the cover of your programs. I love this photo, and there's a painting in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's supposed to be of a 1500 Spanish nobleman. The description of this painting at the Metropolitan Mu Museum, it says, notice the immediacy of presence, the, the elegance of being, and the, uh, oh, the, uh, the piercing intelligence. The immediacy of presence. That's what I see in my grandfather. My grandfather was self-educated. He toured the world. And W.C. said that, that uh, I don't know why people laugh, but I know I can make them laugh. And W.C. did this throughout his career. And I love the quote under it, because to me, it's a pure expression of love. W.C. Field said, if I can make them laugh, and it's on your program, and through that laughter, make this old world seem just a little brighter, then I am satisfied. To me, this almost brings tears to my eyes because this is a true act of love. And it's from the artist to the audience, but it's also from the audience back to the artist, an act of interaction. And that's why I always love seeing my grandfather's films with an audience because it means the love I have for my grandfather is given back to my grandfather on film. And there's nothing more, I think, special gift in the world than that act of love. And we so need this in the world today. And that's why I say the timelessness of W.C. Fields' art and humor is I always say there's no instance in the human condition that we cannot find some solace in W.C. Fields' art through his films, you know, whether it's Teenage children, a difficult marriage, jobs, divorce, even death. And we're going to see a little a glimpse of that today in, in, in these film clips. But we thought, Gary had the term, let's show film clips. And we'll go from mountaintop to mountaintop in the film clips. Now, you could do this all day for weeks and weeks with mountaintops or WC's film, film clips. But I chose, I think there are eight clips, particularly because what I love about my grandfather, and I'm uh, my grandfather's only granddaughter, so I think I have a, if I may say so myself, <laughs> with, my, with my girlfriends here, my girlfriends in the audience, is uh, as, as W.C.'s only granddaughter, I see something, I think I see something different than other people. And to me, it's W.C.'s sweetness and gentleness that is just disarming. And that's what I love about W.C. So what, uh, my grandfather W.C. Fields, so what I chose are film clips to me that show these qualities. And I don't think the public knows enough of these qualities. And my whole goal is to ensure that generations to come, younger generations now, know the, the joy and comfort that W.C. Fields' art through humor brings to the human condition. So I'm committed to do this. And as W.C. says, selflessly and tirelessly, and I'm not a professional granddaughter, but I feel by mere happy accident of birth this is my responsibility, and I take it happily. It's a proud and a very humble responsibility because as the librarian, the then librarian of Congress told me in his office, in, with near tears in his eyes about W.C. Fields, he said, W.C. Fields is the icon of American culture and humor. I can't think of any greater, any greater gift. In 1940, W.C. Fields wrote, Fields for President. And in 2016, it was reissued with a new forward by Mr. Dick Cabot. And we're honoring Mr. Cabot by a book signing of that edition with his new forward. And this will be after the ceremony. So we want to make sure we have time for that. But I'm doing this within the umbrella of what W.C. Fields said. 
He said, always keep close to your family. They'll try and take them away from you. Don't let them. Always keep close to your family. And that's what I'm doing tonight by sharing with you some of my clips, of my favorite clips of WC's gentleness and, and sweetness. And, and so I'm sharing my family, my grandfather with you. So I'm sharing a slice of life with you. We'll let the program begin. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a special added attraction for Bellefontaine only. The great McGonagall will entertain you with his extraordinary feats of legerdemain and conjuring, with which he has entertained and mystified the crowned heads of Europe. And don't forget, folks, tomorrow night, East Lynn. And now, the great McGonagall. <laughs>
don't. I got all I want. Eat them up, lamekins. They're good for you. Would you mind passing me the sugar, please? Pardon me. Wonder how the old jailbird is this morning. If you're referring to my father, I think it's very bad taste. And not a bit funny. My father's only been kind to you. And during the eight years that you've lived here, he's never said one unkind thing about you. You're throwing that up to us, are you? And just because poor Claude cannot find work. <laughs> you needn't throw that in our face. I'm not throwing it in your face or trying to be unkind. But I can't sit here and listen to both you and your son continually belittling my father. He's been too good to you. He's the most trying man ever put on this earth. <laughs> morning, everybody. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, sweetheart. Morning, dear. <laughs> morning. Morning. Well, I had quite an experience last night after handling those criminals. Mm. Yeah, and it was funny the way the whole thing turned out. Uh, yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Indeed, it was. It'll be harder than ever for poor Claude to secure employment when they know that his brother-in-law is an ex-convict. I don't think I should even look for work until this whole thing blows over. Yeah, I think that's right. He isn't an ex-convict. He wasn't in the jail a half hour. He was convicted of manufacturing alcoholic beverages without a permit. He never made illegal liquor. He bought pure apple cider, put it in the garden, let it freeze, and then drained the alcohol off. That's just exactly what happened, dear. Any more wheat cakes and sausage? There would have been if you got to the table when the others got here. Uh, I think it's a shame. Uh, you little rebel, you here. You just have some of these uh, ham and egg, uh, uh, ham and, and ham and Oh, egg. enough of your quarreling. I'm sick and tired of it. Oh, here's one of those delightful fragments by Gertrude Smarton. Would you like to hear it? Would you like to hear it? Oh, oh, yes, I would, dear. Yes, sure, dear. Yeah, sure. We have what we have not. Have we any, uh, sir? What we have not, we have. Up is down. Down is... Are you listening? Oh, yes, dear. I beg your pardon, yes. Are you going to uh, eat the rest of that sausage? And... Yes, I am. Oh, well, that's all right. Down is out. Everyone knew me, and I was happy. Are you listening? <laughs> and we were all happy. Is everybody happy? And I bought a big red apple. Yes, unhappiness is gone. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Very beautiful, dear. Very beautiful. What's it all about? <laughs> what, what you were eating? Yes. About an uh, apple? And the wonderful part of it is, there's no punctuation. Oh, that's wrong. <laughs> that black eye and your condition prove you were drunk and lying in the gutter. I was not drunk. <laughs> there, I knew it. What are you talking about? I saw you at the wrestling matches. You were drunk, lying in the gutter. And you had your secretary with you, and she was drunk, too. Listen, Claude, I've had a lot of trouble in the last 24 hours, and I've just about heard enough from you. I admit that I was wrong, and asking for the afternoon off to go to the wrestling matches and giving it as an excuse, Mrs. Nestle Road dying. <laughs> but that is all. You were drunk and you were lying in the gutter and you did take your secretary. You keep quiet and let my father tell his story in his own way. Don't you yell at me or I'll slap you in the mouth. <laughs> oh, you thief! You thief! <laughs> I'm looking for a row of lib labs. Leave this house and never cross the threshold again. And take that ungrateful minx of a daughter with you. Dad! Come on. I'll exterminate the three of them. Come on. We'll go for a little ride. Rest in peace. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Wait a minute, dear. Well, okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
There's a Mr. Mockenbuck who is arriving from Hungary tomorrow morning. I see by the files that his rating is A1, and he's an important customer, but I can't find anything personal to talk to him about. Where is Wolfinger? I discharged him. You... What for? He lied to you, and he took the afternoon off, possibly to go to that wrestling match. He's been talking about the wrestlers and bragging about his prowess as a wrestler for years. Good gracious, you can't discharge the poor devil for taking one afternoon off in 25 years. Now get him back, and get him back as quickly as possible. Huh. You've left us in a fine mess. I want to get the data on Mr. Muckenbach at once. Where does Mr. Wolfinger keep his files? They're in here, sir. But I'm afraid they'll appear disordered to you. I've tried to install a filing system, but Mr. Wolfinger prefers his own method. Uh, so this is the famous firing system, eh? Ah! Where can we find Wolfinger? I don't know. His wife has thrown him out of the house. She informed me that he attended the wrestling matches yesterday. But this girl, his secretary, accompanied him that they were both drunk and that Wolfinger was found lying in the gutter. This is a gross exaggeration and a fabrication. True, I did attend the wrestling matches. Only because my mother is a very dear friend of Hukalaka Mishabab. But when Hukalaka threw Tossaw from the ring, he struck poor Mr. Wolfinger in the chest, knocking him insensible. What did you expect me to do? Stand there like a dummy and watch my poor boss die in the gutter? You think I'm, I'm going to take your word in preference to this? Stop it! You've overstepped your authority. Come into my office. You get on that phone and locate Wolfinger. And stick to it if it takes all day. Yes, sir. I don't understand how you could have used such bad judgment. Miss Wolfinger. I've got it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Malloy has spoken to me, and uh, inasmuch as Mr. Wolfinger's been with the firm for more than two decades, uh, uh, he thinks that if Mr. Wolfinger will uh, return to work and forget wrestling, uh, Mr. Malloy will accept uh, my suggestion that he uh, return to his old position. Well, thank you. I, I know he'd appreciate that if he were here. But he's in the shower. He's going on an interview this morning to... Who's in the shower? Anybody in the shower? Quiet. What do you mean, in the shower? Sit down and be quiet. I say he's going on an interview this morning to see Mr. Mo Litbach, the president of the Irish Woolen Mills. Mo Litbach, president of the Irish Woolen Mills? Please. He says he's negotiating with the Irish Woolen Mills Limited. Offer him $75 a week and tell his daughter to get in touch with him immediately. Uh, Mr. Malloy has just informed me that uh, on account of his long association with your father, uh, he can offer $75 a week. Well, I don't think that would be adequate. I know that he's considering an offer of um, $100 a week with four weeks vacation at full pay. The Irish Will and Mills have offered him $100 a week and four weeks holiday on full salary. Offer him the same, but have him report here in the morning. How can he report in the morning if you're going to give him a four weeks holiday? <laughs> Gash. Gash. What? Gash! All right. We'll meet the offer, but at the end of the four weeks, I want him here on the job. Uh, Mr. Malloy will meet the offer. Beginning to rain. Oh! Take a drink of this hot coffee, Dad. Oh, oh, oh. Now, honey, sandwiches. This is the film that we want in the time you're 
see it's moving on to add Man and the Flying Trapeze to, as a W.C. Fields' next film to the Library of Congress. Uh, and I, I just want to share a few things. And then when I said, I'd like to have Mr. Cavett and Professor King have a go at it, and, and with their expert analysis. Um, this film in Running Wild, and you notice how awkward W.C. Fields is physically going after someone, because it's, it's so unlike his nature. I just love this. And actually, Mary Bryan, his daughter in this, is also his daughter in, uh, in The Silent Running Wild, and he specifically asked for Mary Bryan to be in this film, and it, it really, in that talking scene, um, from the film we just saw. There, there are a couple of things, and then I want to hand it over to our wonderful guest. Grady Sutton is also in many of W.C. Fields' films. And what I love about this ending, and it gets back to the quote my grandfather said, always keep with your family. They'll try to keep, uh, take them away from you. Don't let them always keep with your family. So he, even though that difficult family, he kept them together. And Kathy, he loved Kathleen Howard. They had great affection and loyalty to each other throughout their careers. And Kathleen Howard, you'll notice in our next film that we screen, is in It's a Gift. And they first met when W.C. Fields turned 21 at the Winter Garden in Berlin. And Kathleen Howard then was an opera singer. And then she came to the Metropolitan Opera here in New York. And then uh, they, they landed in Hollywood together in film. And I just think it's, love, it's just such lovely symmetry. <laughs> and I, I, I want to get to our panelists with other things I could say. His parody on Gertrude Stein. <laughs> Yeah. And so many about what's this all about? And it is with no punctuation. It's about uh, apples. <laughs> I was trying to watch something in there to be, to verify something that someone told me about Field. I mean, your grandfather. And it was that did you ever notice that he always cut the heels off of his shoes? And I think I mentioned that maybe to another of his relatives, and they said, I never heard that. But it made it more like um, <clears throat> the slippers that he works in in the ballet, in, in the juggling scene. Um, anyway, that's my only heels cut off <laughs> <laughs> story. How old would I have to be to have met him? That just hit me when I was watching. 78. I'd have to be 78? Well, he died 46. Couldn't be met Five years old. <laughs> well, I resent the fact <laughs> I don't know why some relative of mine didn't drive me out to California and hold me up. <laughs> I was young, you see. Maybe you were the chairman. I may have been. A memory lapse. Woody Allen and I once met in L.A. and decided at the same instant over dinner, and why don't we find W.C. Fields' house? And we did. The one uh, DeMille, the uh, one where yes. Anthony Quinn, the, Across the street. place where the child had been drowned. Yeah. And um, we found it, and we looked at it, and we just felt silent. We worshiped, is that some corny? <laughs> I imagine that he would come out and say, uh, you fellas want a little nip? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was not to be. And what do you expect when I was four years old? <laughs> Did you ever meet him? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I don't think I have as many celebrity stories as you do. <laughs> the juggling is marvelous. Do you know that you saw in that clip the hardest juggling trick ever invented? And most people don't even remember it. With all the fabulous the balls and the off the floor or off the guy's head. Balancing a stick on your toe and then flipping it end for end and catching it on that same toe. It is said that he practiced that for hours until he fell face forward on the bed in a stupor. <laughs> Difficult concentration. Yeah, try it sometime. <laughs> you might get the stick balanced, but you won't catch it on the other hand. <laughs> or maybe you will. I think the, uh, the way in which the, the juggling scene is incorporated in the old-fashioned way is it's quite characteristic, I think, of early sound comedy, 
where with the coming of sound, a lot of Broadway comedians and vaudevillians were being brought into, brought over to Hollywood. And so, I mean, you know, Fields had already been there, but many of those vehicles are really built and designed to showcase those vaudevillians and Broadway performers, to showcase their specialties. So that's why you, you'll have a W.C. Fields juggling number, or in the Marx Brothers you'll have Chico you know, playing the piano and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. It's that kind of episodic or modular structure which showcases the virtuosity of the performer as opposed to the narrative or the story or anything like that. It's really, it's really very typical, I think, of early sound comedy. It livens it up, sir. Yes. You know, we have, um, uh, we inherited all of W.C. Fields' memorabilia, which is now at the Margaret Herrick Library at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. But, um, so we have film clips, and W.C. Fields, from North Philadelphia as a teenager, he came to New York to the Bowery, and he would practice, he would sit sometimes 20 times a day at the Bowery, he would practice juggling singing. And he said it, to his finger, when you said, until he fell on the bed, till his fingers, would, would bleed, but he said he, he treasured performing that often so he could perfect more. Then two years later, he ends up at, at touring the world at the Winter Garden in Berlin with Kathleen Howard. And Hattie, my grandmother, whom I named after Harriet, um, they were married then, and she was part of his act. And it, it, that passion, it was a teenager, it's a young teenager, uh, and that practice, it's another thing that I just, um, I admire about my grandfather, that, that passion, and to know you have it, and to know you, uh, that the world would respond to it. And every clip we have from every country, um, no matter the continent or the language different, they always praise that American juggler, W.C. Fields. And W.C. Fields, I think, is the first American, and someone might correct me, maybe he's the second, to have a command performance in front of the king and queen in England. And that's Rob's uh, hometown. <laughs> Did they understand it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was another thing. <laughs> he didn't need the juggling, really, did he? That's what's so wonderful. It's such a great bonus to just his entity, his talent, his persona. I heard something, let's see, within the past year, I would say, and I shall now check it with his granddaughter. Somebody, is someone playing a radio in here? <laughs> Dinner in the other room. Oh. Knock it off! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, where was I? <laughs> oh, yes. He said, you know, his voice on screen was not his secret voice. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he didn't always talk like, no, my dear, I never did. He would uh, speak like a normal person, and if he was standing next to you and you didn't know who it was, you wouldn't hear the great W.C. Fields character voice that he produced. Can you go along with that? I can, and actually, um, Rob King, Professor King said that he's, and that's why one of the reasons, except for the endearing sweetness, is to have the scene of it from Man on the Trapeze. <coughs> it's not comedy, that is sweetness and gentleness. That's W.C. Fields' voice. That's W.C. Fields in the breakfast scene. But Professor King, I'd like to ask you, you t said that, that you screened this film, Man on the Flying Trapeze, for your film students. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you tell us what, uh, what you see in that, what you want your film students to see? Because that's our goal, is to make sure younger generations know W.C., and that is our best ambassador. Well, one of the... One of the interesting things about Fields' comedy and the, the reason why I, I, I screen his work is because it's, it's somewhat, the, the typical Fields formula is rather different from what you get in other kind of clown-centered comedies you know, during studio era Hollywood. I mean, typically one, you know, one of the characteristic narratives of, of, of these films is that the, the clown, the comedian, is a kind of eccentric figure. And as the narrative develops, they have to. They have to grow up. They have to kind of you know, become an adult, become responsible in some way. So, 
whatever, you know, Jerry Lewis in the, in the Delicate Delinquents. He has, to, he has to ascend to responsibility by the end of the narrative. Uh, and this is a template that you can even see in more recent films. Elf, for instance, Will Ferrell has to learn not to be an elf. He, like, he has to become, by the end, he becomes a father, he becomes a, a husband, he ascends to responsibility. In Fields films, though, F the Fields character never has to change, right? Rather, what happens is the world changes around him, right? And, and that's why we have these, these typical fairy tale endings to, to Fields films where he will suddenly come into enormous wealth in like the last two or three minutes of the film. So the, the, the entire social constellation will change at the end of It's a Gift, at the end of You're Telling Me, at the end of The Bank Dick, so that you know, by the end of these films he's in some kind of palatial estate. You know. There's nothing wrong with the Fields character. Like, the ex eccentricity can remain. The world has to change to accommodate it. I think that's, that's why I like to show his films as a different kind of articulation of, of, another, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, the, of the comedian comedy plot. Well, you know, that's where I... I... I like to say the timelessness of W.C. Fields' art and humor because it's as current today as it was when they were first made. Yeah. You know, um, in, uh, for May to August 2010, we had the W.C. Fields exhibit at the New York Public Library of Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. And after um, th those months, and every Tuesday, they would screen the W.C. Fields film, and I would come up and speak and have Q&A at the audience. But after they had a, the last closing ceremony of this exhibit, a woman came up to us, and she said um, she had originally seen the films in the 1930s. She was an older woman. And she said, I laughed as hard today as I did then when I first saw them. And she said, and it's the same thing I see in these films. It's so nice because women respond to W.C. Fields films too. She said, W.C. Fields speaks from the heart. He's about love. And I see that, I saw that in the 1930s when the films first came out, and I see it today. And that's so heartwarming. She said, if anyone doesn't get W.C. Fields, they don't know about the heart, and they don't know about love. And that's so profound, and that's the message I want to share with everyone. And I think with our panel, especially Mr. Calvin, but when we had, um, in 2015, June 22nd, a hundred years and one day from W.C. Fields opening and starring on Broadway in the Ziegfeld Follies. We had a tribute to W.C. Fields at the New Amsterdam Lounge, which is just a classically beautifully restored building. And um, we had lunch before, a few months before, just over the program. And if I may say, and you can deny it, but, but you, you told me. I'll deny it now. You said, if there's a heaven, I hope no. I hope W.C. Fields knows I love him. <laughs> I, is, do you mind me sharing that? Uh, he's the only reason I probably would believe in heaven, but, um, <laughs> but I hope that isn't too shocking. Uh, I, I, I've just imagined meeting him. I've imagined coming around a corner at Paramount and, and there he is, and on the lot there. Is a, and when I was working for Jerry Lewis, why do you laugh? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you. Um, I had an office out at Paramount, and I walked into one thinking that was it, and it was not. And these old offices that just reeked of old movie dumb. And there was an old man. Uh, I was a young man at the time. It was dramatic contrast. And he said, uh, come on in, sit down. My name is Paul Jones, Paul M. Jones, as you've seen his name on the field movie screen that produced it. And he was wonderful. And his imitation of your grandfather was faultlessly perfect. It would have given you chills. I don't know, he was probably 75 or 80 then, which to me seemed like 104. <laughs> and he said, Bill used to come in and sit in that chair you're sitting in. I just got a tingle now. <laughs> sitting in an armchair, and he would talk. And sometimes he would you go into an elaborate Fieldsian fantasy. And then I raped the Martha Rogers daughter. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> keep him laughing. 
And George Cukor was, do I mean George Cukor? Yeah, he had a fair amount of time. George Cooker. No. Yeah. George Cooker. George Yeah, not Cooker. Yeah. Yeah. Get the Zucker straight. Uh, would appear at the other end of the hall. He said, pointing out his door at the other end of the hall. He said, "You could just see him from here." And Bill would say, "Hey, Zucker, <laughs> little bastard with him." <laughs> All right, you're looking good. You're good. <laughs> Dang, a lot of them no bigger than a baby's. <laughs> Here's the sad part. He got letters from Fields wherever he traveled, wherever Fields traveled. Yeah. Double, single space, long, fantastical letters, as in the Maharaja's daughter. And um, they said, you know, I had him in the garage. And um, my wife threw him out. Oh. I can't think of a punishment she doesn't deserve. <laughs> Drawn and quartered just for openers. Uh, and he said it was a pile like this. And we became close friends, and I went home, back to New York. ABC decided they were sick of the Jerry Lewis show, preceded by the public. And, uh, <laughs> I think ABC is still paying it off, but a letter arrived from Paul M. Jones, and I thought, oh, my friend, opened it, and there was another letter inside, and the stationery said W.C. Fields, at an angle up in the left corner, and it was an amusing letter from Fields to a friend of his, complaining that he knew he was the one who kept dropping off mortuary brochures on Fields Porch <laughs> and, and funeral home uh, entree cards. <laughs> I know it's that bastard Jack somebody. Um, and I treasure that. I feel, I, I, I just, it's silly, you know. I saw Shakespeare's autograph. There were only three known. I think the one in the British Museum. And you can't help thinking, there it is on there. And his, his hand was here. So he was standing right here. But you're always too late. <laughs> but boy. Now, thank you to our, our panelists. Um, we're going to show the next set of films. Uh, it's a Gift, again with Kathleen Howard. Fatal Glass of Beer, which Professor King, Rob has written a, an essay about, which you said will be published later this year, we believe. We could talk about this afterwards. And there's a clip of the dentist, and where's Mr. Gaines, is here. Oh, there we are. Um, I, I, this is what, um, I, I, want, I want to tell you about it afterwards, but this is a special performance of uh, the dentist. The scene we're going to screen is what W.C. Fields was performing in Earl Carroll Vanities in 1928 on stage. And I, I'll share the rest till after. Morning, Mr. Fitzmillard. Morning. I want 10 pounds of kumquats, ten? and I'm in a hurry. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Come out, I'll, I'll be right with you in half a day. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. The door was open. I know now that it was open, and don't talk to people with a toothpick in your mouth. It's in for one. Come here. Hurry up, get this coat off. What are you doing? Put that hat up. Go out and sweep the store. Hurry up, sweep the stove. Yeah. How about my kumquats? <laughs> coming, coming. I'm in a hurry. Coming, 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 coming. coming. Now, uh, what was that you wanted? Kumquats! Oh, kumquats, yeah. Ten pounds of kumquats. Uh, Open the door for Mr. Buckle! What? Open the door for Mr. Buckle, the blind man! How about my kumquats? What'd you say? Conquats! Wait! <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's all right. All right. All right. You got that door closed again, huh? I, I'm awfully sorry. I'm awfully sorry. Come on, let's go ahead. Don't, don't do it. Wait a minute. What's that? What's that? It's all right. 
Think nothing of it, just a little glassware. What? Just a little glassware. What's the matter with you? Can't here. you talk? Here's your pipe, <laughs> here. Here, here you are, right here. Come on. What'd you say? I said it was nothing but just a little glassware. Uh, what have you got it there for? Come Go on. on. It's all right. Put it in there. Uh, now, uh, what can I do? Uh, what can I do for you? Have you got any chewing gum? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, yes, we have. Yes, yes, we have. How about my kumquats? Coming, 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 coming. Now you just as. Now you sit right here till I come back. I'll bring you right back to you. Sit right there. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Come watch in a minute. I wonder what kind of gum he wants. I guess that. <laughs> sit down, Mr. Muckle. Sit down, sit down. Sit down, Mr. Muckle. Sit down. Hold me a second now. Sit down. Sit down, Mr. Muckle, honey. Sit down. Oh, that's broke. I'll get it fixed. I'll be right with you. Don't go away. Come here. Sit down, Mr. Muckle. Sit down, honey. Come quat. Coming now, you'll get the golf cart for come quats now. Will you sit? Will you mind telling Mr. Muckle? Never mind. I'll, I'll tell him it's all right. Sit down, Mr. Muckle, please. See you. Polite to him. Sit down. <laughs> Put it down, Mr. Muckle. Put it down, honey. Put it down, please. <laughs> Mr. Muckle, please sit down. Please. I want come quash. Coming, coming. Oh. I've got the chewing gun. Where's my gun? Sit down, Mr. Buckle! Sit down! 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 Here's your chewing gun. Five cents, please. Yeah, I'm not going to lug that with me. <laughs> Send it. Oh, yeah. Hey, what? Hey, what? Hey, what? Where are you? Here. Take this over to Mr. Muckle's house. Jump on your bicycle and run right away. Hurry up. Now you're all... No, no, no. Not that way. Not that way. Here we are. Here, here. That's it. How about my kumquat? Oh, excuse me. Yes. How does he rate all his attention? Who is that man? It's a house detective over at the Grand Hotel. <laughs> Excuse me. Come in, come in. Look out. Come in. All right, all right. Come on. All right, all right. Well, you got that door closed again. I'm huh? sorry. I'm sorry. Huh? I say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute now. You're all right. There you are. Go ahead. Nothing coming at all. Speaks clear as a whistle. <laughs> my kumquats. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Coming. Coming, coming. <laughs> coming, coming. Almost one of the kind old gentlemen. Is this 1726 Prill Avenue? No. Mr. of Prill Avenue in this neighborhood. I don't know. Do you know a man by the name of Lafong? <laughs> Carl Lafon, capital L, small a, capital F, small o, small n, small g, Lafon, 
Carl LaFong. No, I don't know Carl LaFong. Capital L, small A. Capital F, small O, small N, small G. And if I did know Carl LaFong, I wouldn't admit it. But he's a railroad man and he leaves home very early in the morning. Well, he's a chump. I hear he's interested in an annuity policy. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yes, it is. The public are buying them like hotcakes. Oh. All companies are going to discontinue this form of policy after the 23rd of this month. That's rather unfortunate. Yes, it will be. Maybe you would be interested in such a policy. No, I would not. Say, what's your age? None of your business. I would say you were a man about 50. Ah, uh, you would say that. Let's see, 50, 50, 50, 50. Ah, here we are. Here we have it. Now, you can, by paying only $5 a week, retire when you are 90 on a comfortable income. I can retire when I'm 90. That's right. You got the idea. Look out! Oh, oh, don't sit down there. Or you can change to a regular paid-up policy and a debt to oh. beneficiaries. Help! Oh. If you and your friend wish to exchange ribald stories, please take him downstairs. My friend! And should you live to be 100, we... Oh. <laughs> well, if I live to be 200, I'd get a philosophy. If you wish to visit with Mr. Bissonnet, come around some morning, say about 10 o'clock. I never want to see him again. Then why did you invite him up here? <laughs> I invite. I'd like it. To... Oh. 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 Nobody got to put the fruit of this among you, miss. <laughs> Vegetable man. <laughs> Vegetable gentleman. which is the capital of Rwanda, is part of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the International Outreach Program. So when I first went to Rwanda in 2012, they put me in touch with Eric Cabera, who's the founder of the Kwetu Film Institute. And at that time, uh, Eric Cabera said of the, uh, and, well, first of all, in that year, we screened WC, two W.C. Fields films under the stars. It was magical. People said that they'll remember this experience forever. But at that time, Eric Cabrera said that W.C. Fields' comic genius is unmatched in the world today. Now, this was 18 years post-genocide, and now it's 24 years. Um, and he also said he wanted to teach his students how to do comedy so they and the country can laugh again. So when I went back last time, I went back next year, if not sooner, um, we screened It's a Gift, the film you just saw uh, with the film students then. And, and but the students laughed throughout as we, as we did this evening. And I asked the students, what made you laugh? And as I think what Professor King was bringing out as well, he said, they said the students said it's about family, it's about real life. W.C. Fields never gets mad. He never hits. He never gives up on hope. And he never gives up on his dream, which we all know is to the orange grove uh, in California, which as Professor King mentioned, he gets. He did. You know, the reality reformed around him. And to me, I thought to myself, this is profound because the students are really talking about themselves. They could have given up hope after the genocide. They were young then. The professor and the students, they could have, uh, they could have hit, they could have continued, but they're going on, they're following their dreams. And I just thought, this is a lesson and another example of the timelessness of W.C. Fields' art and humor, and that's why I wanted this photo and to share it with you. And now we'll continue on with uh, 
the fatal glass of beer. And it ain't a quick night out for man or beast. <laughs> Welcome! on the boys, eh? When you sit down. Thank you. <laughs> I can't find this mouth. Hand me that stethoscope, will you? Will you say ah, please? Ah. Again. Ah. Again. Ah. I almost had a cake again. Ah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Can't say that hurt you. W.C. Fields had chickadee problems, he had canary problems. And when W.C. Fields was performing that scene on stage in Earl Carroll Vanities in 1928, he was arrested in the theater. This was a setup by the Police Department Humane Society because they had called the press in at that time and said, come to the performance tonight, you'll see something. They arrested W.C. Fields in the theater for torturing a canary. And um, the chief magistrate, this, and they threw him in jail overnight, so from 48th and 7th Avenue, they threw him in jail at the Midtown Community Courthouse, which is still there, and it's an historic, a New York historic building, architecture is beautiful. Uh, and then the next day there was a trial. And in this article, there was a transcript of the trial. 
The chief magistrate of the court then, uh, Dr. Felicia, or Judge Felicia Menon, who's now back downtown, the Superior Court, she contacted us and said, I want a permanent tribute to display in the lobby of the courthouse. So she contacted us, she wanted a photo, and uh, there was a ceremony. And now if you go into that courthouse, uh, you'll see the display in the lobby. But also in that courthouse, there are four theaters of the American Theater of Actors. So they brought up the picture up, they, they gave me a tour of the courthouse, and they said, we went into one large room, and they said, this is the, court, the, the, play, this is the courtroom of the actual trial. Well, that courtroom now is an off-Broadway theater of the American Theater of Actors, which was founded, uh, and directed, and still, uh, still there, James Jennings. And I, said to my, and I said to all around me, and I said, we have to have a reading of this transcript of the trial in this courtroom, which is now an off-Broadway theater. So in December 2015, we had the reading and after a performance of it. And afterwards, Mr. Ed Gaines, who's the founder, award-winning producer, off-Broadway theater owner, came up to me and he said, I want to bring this trial, this play to my theater. And that's the St. Luke's Theater on 46th Street. And so we're still, we're working on putting a few more clips together, adding a little more explanation to um, and the transition to the trial and bring it there. So this is something that you'll be able to, to look forward to soon, I hope. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's another really act of love. I met with Mr. Cavett in, in 2015, and Rob King also had a favorite. He said, the program sounds great, but whenever you have any tribute to W.C. Fields, you have to show Mr. Muckle. When Rob King I met with uh, a few weeks ago, he said he first was introduced to W.C. Fields and it was in, in London, and it was Carl LaFong that particularly appealed to him. So in honor of both our wonderful guest panelists, we included those clips. Isn't it a wonderful relief from political correctness? <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that some nitwit screened the movie and cut that scene out for that reason. He should go with the woman who threw the letters away. <laughs> well, you know, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last year, I think, that said that there was a professor here in New York uh, who cut the film out because of politically incorrect, because of Mr. Muckle. So I immediately wrote the Wall Street Journal, and they, they, they called me back within an hour or so. He said, we want to publish your letter. And I said, well, we, the lesson we want to learn from this is W.C. Field's sweetness and gentleness, whereby Mr. Muckle is systematically destroying his store. And what is W.C., he's a failed business person. What is his business? Selling stamps. And if you notice, every time I see a Fields film, I see and hear something different. But yeah. you notice the stamps were never in the package. He had left the stamps on the counter. And package, the package is up with, with nothing there. I have it sent over to Mr. Muckle. The, the house detective of the Grand Hotel. He wanted a stamp in the middle of the block of stamps to have to cut it out. <laughs> Mr. Muckle, honey. <laughs> by the way, there's a great essay by the great British critic, Kenneth Steinem, uh, about Fields. He has a book, I think maybe it's called Personalities, but Google Tynan, T-Y-N-A-N, um, uh, uh, on uh, Amazon. <laughs> and he does brilliant profiles of Bogart and uh, Cagney and Beatrice Lilly and Tynan was a great wit and so the profiles are witty and W.C. Fields and it's just priceless. He loved Mr. Muckle Honey <laughs> and I remember, I think it's in that that I learned, I uh, remember the time I knocked down the waterfront now and the guy says, you didn't knock her down, I did. <laughs> yeah, but I started kicking her first. <laughs> and then he says, if you ever kicked a woman with a pair of corsets on, <laughs> I nearly break my, uh, broke my great toe. <laughs> That's absurd. You know, well, on, the, on the topic of great essays written about fields, it's, it's interesting that the, the great American uh, literary critic, mm -hmm. Howard Bloom, uh, wrote an essay on uh, the fatal glass of beer uh, in which he, he, he claims for, for him that the fatal glass of beer is the, is the greatest movie ever made, uh, in, in his opinion. You mm -hmm. liked his opinion. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, the truth is, the third man is the most perfect movie. Yeah. No, there's nothing wrong with the fatal lines of Well, you know, growing up, when I saw that, when I saw that as a child, I thought it was the most boring set of yeah. 18 minutes. But as an adult, I realized it's brilliant. Every, every I know. action. There's nothing wrong with it. No, every, every movement, and you know, we couldn't keep all the clips in, but you know, when you throw in the, throwing snow on his face, you know, each time, you know, fit night night from enemies. One of the scenes, he says, it, it tastes like cornflakes, which, which it was. <laughs> now, this, uh, Professor King, you're writing an essay on Fatal Glass of Year. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, well, it's, it's a very short essay. It's, it's um, uh, not, not because there are not interesting things to say about it, but it's unquestionably, I think, the most divisive of Fields' films. It's, it's a film that I think people either love deeply or, or kind of dismiss or, or don't get somehow. Um, and so the, the essay is, in, in part, it's about like, what do we do with past laughter? When, when you're a historian of comedy, you often encounter jokes that don't, you don't understand why they were funny at the time, you know, or how they could be funny. And, and I use Fatal Glass of Beer in, in, uh, like to explore it from that perspective, but one of the, when I was researching the, 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 the film, I, uh, I came across a, a review of the original stage act, uh, which I think was also part of the old Carol Vanities of 1928. Uh, in which the, the critic celebrates the stage act from which the failed glass developed. And he celebrates it by, by describing it as, as art hokum. And I think that, that phrase, art hokum, mm -hmm. is, is almost the, the perfect description of, of Fields' comic sensibility. That there's something kind of hokum, there's something kind of atavistic, something throwback about Fields. But something. But at the same time, he's rearranging it. You know, he's doing. He's playing with it at the same time. So, I like. I like the term art hokum a, a great deal, and so that's that's one of the things that I get into in the essay. Can we use that phrase ourselves? Yeah, no, I, I think it, I think it should be resurrected. I think we, uh, yeah, comedians should be working yeah. within the vein of art hokum. Or, or I just art. thought of a terrible thing. <laughs> Just to liven up the uh, <laughs> sense of fun. Um, a famous woman who had a column, and I don't know how many years ago, I was a copy boy at Time Magazine, $90, $60 a week. And at the copy boy table were newspapers laid out, and I saw bold print and this woman's name. And she had as an item, everybody tells me how funny W.C. Fields. You know what I'm about to say? How funny W.C. Fields is. Well, I went to one of his movies yesterday, and I have news for you. He is not funny. <laughs> I don't want to say this dumb woman's name, but her initials were Dorothy Kilgallen. <laughs> All you need to know about her. <laughs> want to read more about that, that's part of your forward to WC oh, Fields it? for this, <laughs> which we'll be having on the back on your, on your way out for the cabin to sign. I gotta get some new material. No! <laughs> she killed Alan. You know, she poked pinholes in her mask on What's My Line. <laughs> Hired a lawyer to keep it quiet. <laughs> How do you do? Is there a lady in attendance here? Huh? Is there a lady in attendance here? Oh, oh, yes, 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 I'll be right down. Here I am. Thank you. Hurry up downstairs, dear. The two ladies down there, they won't let me wait on them. They, uh, they want a lady to wait on them. Oh, they I simply won't. can't go down looking they the way I do. They won't tell me what they want. Up a bit first. I'll go down, Pop. You sit there and eat your spinach. Will you hurry up down? Well, if I'm going to clerk in the drugstore, I'll simply have to get some decent-looking clothes first. Hurry up down, dear. We're going to lose their trade. Dropping, 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 dropping. Excuse me, down half a moment. We won't be able to wait much longer. Oh, uh, 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 she'll be down. Uh, she'll be down just half a tick. She'll be right down. 
Just uh, she won't move. Just, just wait. Uh, she'll be right down. Right now. Oh, oh Bishop. Uh, Ladies are getting very impatient. We're going to lose their trade. <laughs> She'll be right down now. Coming now. What can I do for you? Is there a ladies' restroom here? <laughs> yes. Right over there. The first door on your left. Thank you. You fool! Why didn't you tell them? They didn't ask me anything about it. I asked oh. them. Uh, the bartender didn't tell me. How are you going to know, little? Uh, how do you do, sir? No, I know. Can I do for you? this great and grand and glorious United States of ours, just to satisfy your depraved taste, a thousand no's. I have never had or sold a bottle of liquor since I've opened this place. No? Well, you're not fooling me. I'll get you yet. Well, maybe and maybe not. <laughs> I look a little screwy when I get in there. First time I saw did I understand you to say you were giving souvenirs away? Oh, mother! Oh, that's what? all right. Yes, yes, that's all right. Yes, yes, we are, yeah. Oh, 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 oh mother, is it lovely? Aren't you glad I asked? Aren't you glad I asked? Would you like one there? Oh, you're so kind. Oh, that's all right. That's quite all right. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I think gorgeous. Whenever you want any stamps, don't forget us. Thank you, we won't. Same place for uh, 15 years now. We control all the stamp business in this neighborhood. <laughs> There goes Sam Bisbee, drunker than a hoot owl. Is he a hard drinker? Hard. It's the easiest thing he does. <laughs> looks like I'm holding you up. No, no, I got plenty of time. I got nothing to do. Pardon me. I should have brought a little Vaseline with me. <laughs> My golly, I put over a big deal today. <laughs> oh, will my wife and kids be tickled to death?
I beg your pardon. It was the wind. I bet he's got a woman in there. I wouldn't be surprised. There. What did I tell you? I beg your pardon. Oh, I beg yours. I thought this was the gentleman's uh, drawing account, the uh, washout. If you don't mind, I think perhaps. Oh, hmm? uh, I'm, I'm going right away. I beg your pardon. What's this? What are you up to? Don't do it, little lady. It don't pay. When you wake up in the morning and find yourself dead, it's too late to regret it. What are you talking about? Don't commit suicide. You're too young. You're too beautiful. I got here just in time. What makes you think that I... I was going to do the same thing. You. On this train, not five minutes ago. Suppose I'd have sent a telegram. I had to go through with it. How terrible. Oh. Are you so unhappy? Little lady, you think you've got troubles? Listen to mine. I lost my car, I lost my tires, and I lost my patent nose lifter upper. Nose lifter upper? Yeah, nose lifter upper. The only one in existence. My own invention. Poor man. When I get back to town, everybody will laugh at me. Except my wife, she won't think it's funny. She'll murder me. But can't you explain to her as you explain to me? Oh, you don't know my wife. The other night we had some folks at dinner. I said, Abigail, dear, is it okay if I take my vest off? She said, you don't mind keeping your pants on, do you? Uncalled for sarcasm. Yeah, the great commoner, uh, Brian, almost went through our town one time. Really? Yes. Crystal Springs. Oh, thank you. Has he come out yet? No, he's still in there. I feel sorry for my little daughter. I depended upon this trip to put her over. And your daughter? Yeah, she's a sweet kid, but she's in love with a rich clown. Clown? Son of the Murchison family. The richest people in Crystal Springs. Oh, I see. Society. Yeah, Mrs. Murchison. Looks like an old Newfoundland doll. Don't you care for society? No, we don't go in for it. We live on the other side of the railroad tracks, but you wouldn't understand that. I think I understand. It's the same in my country. Only we call it class distinction. Ah, uh, we still call it railroad tracks. Here's my little daughter. It's my wife on the other side. She's Ain't lovely. she a honey? She's lovely. It's sad to be young and in love and not to marry the loved one. Don't you think so, Mr. Uh... Uh, Bisbee's the name, but my friends all call me Sam. All right, Sam. But your daughter should marry the man she loves. 
There must be a way in this country. Only a fairy princess could put it over now. And there ain't no such thing. Don't be too sure, Sam. You never can tell when a fairy princess might come to your rescue. Thanks, thanks. And uh, Miss, uh, what's your name? My friends call me Marie. Oh, thanks, Marie. If you ever get down to Crystal Springs, you must stop in to see us. My wife and daughter will be tickled to death to see you. Well, I hope I haven't bored you. Bored me? You saved my life. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, Crystal Springs, don't forget it. Six of the kinds, W.C. Fields, pool, uh, pool routine. Yes. And then the most enduring to me clips from David Copperfield. And then we'll all come back. Exactly. Okay. Tell me, Sheriff, how did you ever get the name of Honest John? The time of which I speak, I'm tending bar up at Medicine Hat. Well, a guy used to come in there with a glass eye. <laughs> call you Honest John. I was saying, one day he forgot his glass eye. I found him. The next morning when he came in, I said, young man, here's your glass eye. And I gave it back to him. Ever since that time. Ever since that day, I've been known as Honest John. Hi, Mike Toby. You've been here three weeks, ain't you? Yes, sir. Then why ain't you learning nothing? Gentlemen, Put your back into it. Gentlemen! 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 In the aggregate, I judge you to be a highly distasteful collection. And a detail cowardly, uncouth, and deserving of merciless chastisement. You will oblige me by removing your unsavory persons from my immediate vicinity. In short, get out! Oh, thank you, Mr. Micawber. You're so kind to me. Not at all. And now, since this is a red-letter day, in that I am hourly expecting something extraordinary to turn up, let us return and discover what culinary triumphs Mrs. Micawber has prepared for us. Oh, how wonderful. Imperative, my dear Copperfield, imperative. For as I have frequently had occasion to observe, when the stomach is empty, the spirits are low. My motto has always been, nil desperandum. In short, never despair. I have an aunt in Dover. I thought perhaps The I... very thing. My dear Copperfield, your aunt will welcome you with open arms. She may not want to see me. Is not blood thicker than water? But Peggotty told me she's very cantankerous. Perhaps she'd shut me out. And Dove is a long way. True, too true. Nevertheless, as the bard says, nothing attempted, nothing gained. And should this formidable aunt repulse you, write me a letter. We are friends for life, young Copperfield. Who we two here run around the braze and pulls the gowans fine. And Although what gowans are, I'm not exactly aware. However, we'll take a pull at them just the same. <laughs> Miss Trockwood, Mr. Copperfield, and Mr. Dick. Uh, 
Well, this, this is an unexpected pleasure, Miss Trotwood. <laughs> There have been some changes in the office since I was an humble clerk. <laughs> but I'm not changed, Miss Trotwood. No. I think you're pretty constant to the promise of your youth. If that's any satisfaction to you. Oh, thank you for your good opinion. No good opinions wasted on you, you're a heap. Still seeking a quarrel, Master Copperfield? I'm seeking more than that. Don't wake me, Gother. What are you waiting for? Because, because, in short, I choose. Oh, you were always a worthless fellow, as all the world knows. You'll oblige me to get rid of you. Now, you come along. I'll talk to you presently. Now, there's a scoundrel in all this world with whom I've talked too much. That scoundrel's name is Heap. Uh, I see. A conspiracy, eh? Well, we understand each other, you and me. There's no love between us. You was always a puppy with a proud stomach when you first come in here. You envy me, me rise. You make nothing of this. I'll match you. Mr. McCorbin, there's a change in this fellow that assures me we're right. Deal with him as he deserves. <sighs> Precious set of people, ain't you? Trying to buy me clerk over. The very scum, as you yourself was, Copperfield, before anyone had charity on you. Miss Wickfield, if you have any love for your father, don't you join them, because if you do, I'll ruin him. Scoundrel! Miss Wickfield, Mr. Wickfield, and others whom it may concern in denouncing the most consummate villain that ever existed, I ask no consideration for myself, but I declare that Heap and Heap only of the farm of Wickfield and Heap is the forger and cheat. Liar! Ah! Bugging you for this. You want to carry down my orders? You're really as much as I. Approach me, approach me, you, 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 you heap of infamy. And if your head is human, I'll break it. I cast off your yoke. I defy you. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> My charges against Heaper is as follows. First, he has caused Mr. Whitfield to sign documents of importance, representing them as of no importance thereby empowering Heap to draw out trust monies. Prove this, you Copperfield, only good time. Second. Heap has systematically forged the various books and documents the signature of Mr. Whitfield. I have in my possession several limitations of Mr. Whitfield's signature. The work of this monster, Heap. I have now concluded and although poverty and imprisonment may follow, I trust that the labor of these investigations may be as a sprinkling of sweet water on my funeral pyre. I ask no more. The male of justice, let it be said of me, as of a gallant naval hero, that what I have done, I did for England, home, and beauty. Yours, etc., 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 Wilkins Micawber. Well, what I just wrote to W.C. Fields and said, you should get an Academy Award. And I think he should have, too, as Best Supporting Actor as well as McCarver. Professor King, um, could you tell us why you screen all through, uh, but you, you love the touching scene in your television that, that we saw, but you, why you screen this with your film students? What message do you want them to take away from your telling me with Princess Let's Go Bora? Well, I, I think the... That, that sequence in particular is so interestingly constructed. It's, I mean, effectively, it's it's two suicide scenes or two attempted suicide scenes, a, a comically failed suicide that begins at the sequence with Vernon Dent, and then subsequent to that, a kind of misrecognized suicide. And and it, it, it flips, you know, the, the first sequence with Vernon Dent is played as slapstick comedy. And the, like the idea of the, the, the failed suicide, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the clown who's trying to kill himself, who's usually himself, uh, but who can't do it, it's quite a familiar gag. You see it in Harold Lloyd a bunch. Uh, but what I think is so interesting about the sequence in, in Field's hands 
is that he, he plays that familiar routine, but then answers it with the dramatic sequence uh, you know, with Princess Lescabura uh, the, that immediately follows. In a sense, it's a kind of Chaplin-esque move to have slapstick and then to kind of uh, to, to balance that with, well, in, in, in Chaplin, it would be pathos, it would be sentiment, to have the two in play together. But with Fields, it's, you know, I mean, there's the same kind of interplay. But I, I think that it's not sentimental. You know, it doesn't come off as dripping with pathos in, in, in Fields' hands. And, you know, and I think, as you mentioned, it, it, it speaks to his qualities, uh, not only as a, as a scenarist, but as, a, as, a, as an actor. That's something that when you say W.C. Fields is actor, I mean, in one thing, comedians didn't get Academy Awards, and they still, still rarely do, and I think they were really discriminated against, but, but he, he, I mean, I love the fact that you say it's W.C. as an actor as yeah, well. Yeah, he's a good realistic actor. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the same, we picked that same up in David Copperfield. Um, people said uh, Dickens must have wrote Macabre with W.C. Fields in mind. W.C. Fields so respected Dickens, I mean, all the classics, but so respected Dickens that he did not ad lib once in this film. He did some of his hat routines, you see, he snuck them in there. And I just, I just think it's a labor of love. I love this, I love W.C. Fields in this film. Harriet, we're gonna now, if you raise your hand if you have a question. First, I want to say what an honor it is to be here with uh, Dick Cabot. Uh, I host the weekly TV show, Education, Arts, and Social Change, for Public Voice Salon. You're my talk show hero. Just to be in your presence. It's a great honor, sir. Uh, Are you sober? Yes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say about you, right? Um, I've gotten to know, I have the great honor to get to know Pat Cooper who's one of the great comedians of the 20th century. He's yeah. turning 89 next month. Uh, we become friends. I call him once a month, and I don't know if anyone knows Pat Cooper. He's very cantankerous. He likes to yell. So I call him up once a month, he yells at me, and uh, but he makes me laugh in between. And there's a kind of therapeutic nature, you know, to, to, to humor. That, and also a book by Steve Allen called How to Be Funny where he says that it is possible to become funnier if you want to be uh, by exposing yourself to the culture of humor and also by being around funny people. I wanted to ask you about humor in your own life in terms of how you use it and did you ever want to be funnier uh, in terms of you know, your own TV? I mean, your thing is very funny, I don't know, but yeah. The role of humor in your life. I missed the question for <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, well, very well. <laughs> I'll meet you later. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask uh, Harriet Fields, um, how much of your own of your grandfather's perspective do you see in your own life? His his sort of point, his way of looking at things, that sort of slightly askew way of looking at things. How much of that do you feel that you inherited from him? You know, we grew up. Um, with a photo of W.C. Fields, and he was, I don't even think he was out of his teens, a young man on a ship. And we think it's to South Africa, but it might have been to Australia, but I think it was South Africa, you know, and people dressed formally then. And um, I grew up looking at this, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I thought, what, I tried looking in his eyes, and I thought, what does he see? What does he know to make him believe in himself, that his art, that he just has this passion as an artist to share with the world, and I thought, I'll never know this. And I didn't, but now I do, because I'm just playing catch up decades, decades later, because of the work I do. I'm, WC took risks, and I'm taking a risk now with the global health work, but just evolved really within the last uh, six years. Um, so I see that, and that's why I go to the lobby of the new Amsterdam Theater and I stand in, the, in front of the full length photo of my grandfather and I say, thank you, grandfather. Thank you for freeing me. So I hope that answers your question. Mr. Robert Clark. Um, I was on once my line. They flipped all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> they took off their blindfolds. They still didn't get me. Harry, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I wonder if you and any of you, uh, 
as a king, have seen almost like peeking behind the magic. Uh, there is a DVD called um, uh, what's it called? Forbidden Hollywood. Um, and there is an entire sequence in which W.C. Fields did a film called Tales of Manhattan that was completely left out of the movie. And uh, your brother, Ronald, talked uh, anecdotally about it. He kept on ad-libbing a line that this French director hated, which may have been one of the reasons it was cut. It was hilarious. But there were outtakes, and you see him with Margaret Dumont in the back of a car. Uh, have you seen that? Yes. Where he goes, you know, take, let me try it again, let me try it again. And it's sort of speaking. I've seen outtakes of Chaplin. Um, I never saw any of him except for that. And he becomes sort of, um, there's a, a kind of human quality that you never see on screen. And by the way, uh, that you're telling me is the closest he comes to pure drama, and I agree, it isn't maudlin. You know, I mean, uh, he at the end of Old Fashioned Way, when he's going to lose his job, and you know, and it's sentimental, and he gets serious for a moment, but that was amazing, that uh, with Princess. But I just wanted to remind everyone, it's called, I think, Forbidden Hollywood. And there are a lot of outtakes of different movies, but that one is a 10-minute segment. I wonder if you could tell me if it's true that he had trouble sleeping and he brought in a barber chair into the house because he felt that was the only place he ever could sleep. So he slept in the barber chair. And, and also that he was very funny about money. And every town that he went to play in throughout the United States, He'd have a bank account, and then he'd forget where the money was. And he's actually... He did open several bank accounts in his name because people knew when performers were performing, often in the afternoon, and then people who were uh, wanting to get money by nefarious uh, means would go break into their rooms and steal their money. So as soon as W.C. Fields got paid in any city, he would put it in a bank account there, but under his name, and all those accounts have been collected. Oh. But, but, but W.C. performed some of those old, his own lists. I always assumed they were under Otis Gribble Cobb, listed some <laughs> other names. Isn't that wonderful? Charles Bogle. Yes. <laughs> what about the Baba chair? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, W.C. performed... Um, uh, perpetuated some of those myths, like he hated children, like he hated dollars. Um, Next question. And Watching the clips, I'm struck, struck by the fact that two of the last centuries greatest comedians were not only fantastic jugglers, but also highly gifted verbal comedians, those comedians being Fred Allen and W.C. Fields. Is there a link between physical and verbal comedy, or are they separate gifts, and these two gentlemen simply happen to possess them at all? You know, Mr. Cabin, you also have this, or, or I, I asked you this question once. First of all, I think you posed the question and then you answered it. Oh. Is it possible to be funnier than W.C. Fields? Because you you combine all those qualities. You said physical ability, aesthetics, mm -hmm. psychology, and th th that is the art, which in some ways you, you really can't define it in a way. And I, and I know you made at that time uh, Robin Williams had just passed. Yeah. And and, and so it it, it, um, it, it leads, and, and, but also you took, you were a magician, weren't you? I have been, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, those, I think those combinations that you wrote about. The uncut version of Tales of Manhattan with the field sequence, which includes uh, Phil Silvers, had been shown on the Fox movie channel a few months ago, I think I've seen it on it twice. I don't know whether it's available on DVD, but there's something that they do. You know, part of our Margaret Herrick Library con uh, collection is we have that, and it, it's part of the WC Traveling Exhibit, which came to Lincoln Center in 2010, and then that whole intact scene. And the question about WC Fields, he was serious about his art, and in some of his routines, he would practice, 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 and the rest of the, the, the crew were, were waiting for W.C. To, 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 he got to the point that he thought it was good enough to start filming. So he took his art seriously. Uh, Dr. Fields and Mr. Kevin, you both have met um, Mae West before. Can you explain what the beef was between them and if they ever settled that beef? Are you talking to me? <laughs> uh, so both of you had met Mae West before. Uh, yes, yeah. 
I was unforgettable. <laughs> <laughs> I did a special with Mae West, and um, somewhere I have a tape illegally phone conversation with her. And I hope to find it someday, in which she went on for 10 minutes about how she suspected that Bill went in at night and crossed out some of my best lines. Um, a touch of paranoia there. But um, she was uh, <coughs> sitting on the set where I, the special I did with her and in Hollywood at the soundstage, with all the hair and the hat like this. And the director from the booth said, uh, could you take the hat off, Mrs. West, for a moment? And Edith Head stuck her head into the, into the picture. I was watching on a monitor. And she said, the hat does not come off. <laughs> I think half of Miss West's face was tied to it. Or and uh, she was a selfish old bag and never thought anything of anything but herself. Uh, but she was, she was something pretty good. Um, I just want to say that considering how generous he was with all of his ensemble of players, it's hard for me to believe that he was taking lines away from Mae West. Um, but I also want to um, mention that there's a, there's a great article on Kathleen Howard on a website called sisterscelluloid.com, um, and it talks about her entire career, and um, among other things, she ended up in the hospital when she was in the movie um, Ball of Fire with Barbara Stanwyck because she got to Dr. Barbara Stanwyck without her. Um, but it talks about she, her career. She was a Harper's Bazaar editor. She had a number of careers, including being a, a fabulous character actress. And also, in that story, there's a link to her autobiography. She actually wrote her memoirs. Um, we have a quote from Kathleen Howard. It, 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 they were great friends, and they respected each other as, as, as artists. But we have a quote from her. She said, um, the two people you never uh, co contradict, and that's uh, sopranos and comedians. She said, but I, being a good little contralto, would just pick up on Bill's cues because every time they did a scene, he would add them differently. And being a good little contralto, I would just pick, on his, uh, pick up on his cues and then respond accordingly. And I thought that was lovely. Uh, but, you know, growing up, I always thought Kathleen Howard's my grandmother, Hattie, because Hattie was buxom, authoritarian. And W.C., you know, did this deliberately. It was his way of, you know, trying to make sense of it, the family life he always wanted. And as a child, you don't make the, you know, you, do, you allow for the differences. Kathy Howard was taller and had blonde hair. My grandmother was shorter and had darker hair. Uh, but I love her, and I'd love to, to get that reference from you. I, I just I adore her. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to first thank our panelists Professor Rob King of Columbia University, the incomparable Dick Cabot, and Dr. Harriet Fields. We do have, we do have a book signing in the back. Please take a look there. Um, on behalf of the National Arts Club Film Committee, I'm Gary Shapiro. Good night. Once at an actor's equity meeting, there was a panel of about this length, and in the middle was the old film actress Blanche Yurka, Madame Defarge, and you know what. And they put the mic in front of her, and she was offended. And she said, I am a trained theatrical woman and actress, and I do not need this infernal invention. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.